Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm uh, Christian Lutzenitz. Uh, I'm the uh, senior lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist art uh, here at SOAS. And I'm uh, kind of welcoming you uh, to this uh, kind of series of two, two talks. Uh, in my role as interims chair of the research and publication support of the Southeast Asian Art Academic uh, Program. And uh, also in the name of uh, the SOAS Center of Southeast Asian uh, Studies Seminar Series. Uh, we are here kind of together to kind of celebrate uh, one of or the, the first volume uh, of uh, uh, publication series that has been put together by Saab and the Nas uh, National University of Singapore Press, namely the book on returning Southeast Asia's past, objects, museums, and restitution, which is, uh, of course, uh, edited by the two chairs of today's and tomorrow's uh, talk. And so today, uh, lecture will be chaired by uh, Banga Adyansha, who is a PhD candidate of the history of art and archaeology at SOAS uh, in his kind of approaching his second year. Uh, his main interest is on the uh, afterlifes and knowledge production of Hindu Buddhist materials in Indonesia, which brings him to read uh, with passion and colonial on colonial collection practices and object restitution, as well as his historiography of modern Indonesia. His PhD research focuses on how the Hindu Buddhist materials in Indonesia um, produced during the so-called classical period between the 5th and the 15th centuries were repurposed and reused during the so-called Islamic period, ranging from the 16th to the 18th century. Uh, so, uh, I give over to uh, the chair of this session. Thank you, Christian, and hello, everybody. And glad to see a big number of attendees now today uh, for this morning or this morning London time talk. Uh, but uh, before I start introducing the panel today, um, first of all, uh, personally, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to uh, Mr. Ramoh Arif Rahman, uh, the Education and Cultural Attaché at the Indonesian Embassy in London, uh, who I believe is among the attendees today as well, uh, who has been very helpful in designing and making this uh, panel happen. So thank you, Arif. Uh, okay, so today's panel is titled uh, The Politics of Restitutions. Uh, and the idea is to consider different kinds of modalities as well as nature of cultural diplomacy that has enabled uh, or would engender uh, object restitutions. And in this regards, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker for today. So uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jos van Burdens, uh, who is a researcher of colonial cultural collections and restitution issue affiliated to the Fry University Amsterdam. Uh, in June, or next month, actually, his book uh, titled in Dutch, uh, but I believe the English translation would be Uncomfortable Heritage, um, Colonial Collection and Restitution in the Netherlands and Belgium will come out. Uh, in the past, his pioneering study, uh, the treasures in trusted hands, uh, negotiating the future of colonial cultural objects, uh, was nominated for the NWO Bookman Dissertation Prize and has been published in 2017. He has also written several other books on issues related to restitutions. Uh, in a, he is also running the mailing list and Facebook page uh, RM or Restitution Matters with news clipping about restitution of colonial collection. So thank you just for being with us today. Um, the next speaker is actually a very special one. Uh, we have Mr. Imal Farid. Uh, he's, uh, he is a cultural Sorry, he is a historian and cultural activist. In the 1970s, 1990s, he was uh, active in the pro-democracy movement 
and is also a founding member of Jaringan Kerja Budaya, a collective of artists and cultural workers in the early 1990s, and also in the Institute of Indonesian Social History in 2000s. He taught history and cultural studies at the Jakarta Art Institute uh, and University of Indonesia for several years. Uh, he received his PhD from the National University of Singapore and wrote his thesis on Pramodya Anatatur and the politic of decolonization in Indonesia. He has been an active member of the Asian Regional Exchange for New Alternatives or ARENA and the Inter-Asia Cultural Studies Society. On December 2015, after a long selection process, he was appointed as, and I believe as still is, the Director General for Cultures at the Ministry of Education and Cultures of the Republic of Indonesia. So, Pailmar, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. It is thank an honor you. for you to have us, to have you here with us. Um, last but not least, uh, our discussion for today's panel is Seang Soka. Uh, he studied archaeology for his bachelor degree at the Royal University of Fine Art in Cambodia. Uh, between 2006 and 2013, he worked as a language and epigraph researcher uh, for the Research Center for Computational Linguistic in Bangkok. He received uh, two master degree. Uh, the first one is in Southeast Asian Studies at Chua Long Kong University, Bangkok. And the second one is in the History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS University of London. Uh, between 2016 and 18, he was a researcher for the Inventory and Registration Office of the National Museum of Cambodia. Currently, he is a third year PhD student of the Department of History of Art and Archaeology here at SOAS. So, Soka, good afternoon, I believe. Uh, glad you can join us from Phnom Penh. Uh, so, let's move on uh, to, the, to our panel today. Uh, first of all, first, uh, sorry, first talks, uh, Josh will present his uh, presentations on Lessons for the Futures, uh, returns by the Netherlands to Indonesia in the, in the 2010s and in the 1970s. So between 1949 and 1975, Indonesia and the Netherlands negotiated the returns of a number of cultural and historical objects lost during the colonial era. At the time, uh, the Netherlands was praised internationally for these returns. So, but how do we look at it now? Just asked. In 2013, the municipality of Delft made a generous offer to Indonesia, the repatriation of the bigger part of the collection of the defunct Nusantara Museum, some 15,000 objects. Finally, in December 2019, only uh, 1,500 of them were shipped to Indonesia. What actually happened in between, and how generous was the Dutch offer? If return of an involuntary lost heritage is meant to heal a relationship that was violated and to undo some of the injustice from the colonial past, what can be learned from these two returns? Josh, screen is yours. Thank you, um, thank you very much, Panga. First of all, I would like to congratulate you, Panga, and also Luisa Titakot for, for your hard work for this beautiful and rich volume, Returning Southeast Asia Past. It's really a, a useful contribution to the literature that exists. And I also thank you for allowing me to say a few words about returns by the Netherlands to Indonesia. And it's a pleasure to do so in dialogue with Director General Hilma Farid and Siang Soka. And um, um, Mr. Farid, I can say that I read all Palm's books but in the 1970s, I remember, you know, and I was fascinated by them. The books he wrote on the island of Buru. Okay, good. Um, but there is a change. There seems to be a change in Europe in the former colonial powers. You know, both the authorities and museums, they are changing their views on how to deal with collections from colonial contexts. But the question is whether this is a trend that only reassures the people in the global north or whether it is a tipping point that really changes the relationship between former colonized and colonizers. Now we will know the answer to this question only in the future, 
But to deal with the future, we have to understand the past. And that's where I go now. I go to the 1970s. You know, it took the Netherlands and Indonesia over a quarter century to come to an agreement on the return of uh, cultural objects. Belgium and the Democratic Republic of Congo needed 10 years. Australia and Papua New Guinea only a few years. Why did it take so long? I think there are a few reasons for that. And if possible, it would be nice if the, if the slideshow could start, the PowerPoint. But I, I, I will just, yeah, there it comes, good. And go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, there were, on both sides, there were wounds because of the 1945, 1949 violent period and the war of independence. And it was really hard. You know, there was a very poor relationship between Indonesia's president Sukarno and the Dutch government. There was, you know, the, the Netherlands, they had charged in the negotiations um, Indonesia with an enormous amount of debt as compensation for lost Dutch interests. And that meant that political independence was not accompanied by economic independence. So Indonesia was holding back, did not trust the Netherlands. And on the slide, um, on your right side, you see that some assistants are carrying away portraits of governor generals of Indonesia. All in all, in fact, you know, the, the strange thing was that Indonesia was the first of the two countries that returned objects to the other. And they returned over 60 portraits of these colonial officials. But it, the picture also gives me a feeling, you know, they just wanted to get rid of them. They had to go away, go away. So in 1949, the two countries agreed formally to Indonesia's independence during a roundtable conference. And at that roundtable conference, one of the subcommittees was on cultural affairs. Now this, this subcommittee was charged with the task of preparing a cultural agreement. And the cultural agreement included an article, Article 19 on restitution. Now, unfortunately, it was quite good thing but it never became effective and then we went to the um you know i make a big leap next slide please we go to 1968 because between 1949 and 1968 not much happened there were all sorts of problems one was that um you know there was the the, the papua question the dutch tried to get to keep hold on it and they gave in only in 1962. There was the 1965 coup d'etat in Indonesia, which aroused quite some indignity in the Netherlands. And there were all sorts of friction. And, um, but finally, you know, the, 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 the two parties, they remained in touch with each other. And especially on archives, they came to an agreement. And in general, you can say that in negotiations, uh, post-colonial negotiations on, on, on restitution, archives are easier to deal with than objects. Objects are more, more touchy. So in 1968, there was a cultural agreement. And what was striking in the agreement was it was on archives, but also that the Dutch were pushing for the principle of reciprocity. It meant that, you know, if I give something to you, you give something to me. And that's also a change from today, because nowadays we say, well, the way we were dealing with objects, with archives, with human remains at the time, you know, is, has been some or other form of, of injustice, and this injustice has to be made undone. So a big change is, at that time we were talking about reciprocity, nowadays they, we wouldn't do that anymore. And one of the reasons behind this reciprocity was that some of these colonial archives, they contained information which was very negative about the Netherlands. They contained information about military operations, for instance. And the Dutch wanted to have it back. So finally, they, they discussed this and they finally agreed that, you know, um, normally with archives, they go to the successor state. So that means all Dutch colonial archives 
would have to go to Indonesia, also the Japanese. And but finally they said, well, let's be pragmatic. And you know, we are going to make copies of all the archives, make them available to two sides. And there has been quite some fruitful uh, cooperation between the Archive Nationale in Jakarta and the National Archive in The Hague. And you even could say that the, the, the cultural agreement on, archi on archival cooperation has been some sort of a warming up for agreement about cultural objects. Now in preparation, the next slide please, you know, both sides, they did certain things. Like the Netherlands, they sent a high ranking official of the Dutch Ministry of Culture, a lady to Indonesia on a secret mission. And she did go there um, as a member of the, Dutch, the Netherlands Association of Housewives. So she didn't say I'm an, I'm an official, but in the meantime, she was looking around, how is the, the current government in Indonesia, the then government dealing with cultural institutions, dealing with cultural objects, with exhibitions, et cetera, et cetera. And she was reporting at home. But Indonesia was also doing things. In 1971 already, they sent some officials of the embassy in The Hague, uh, for instance, to the military museum in Arnhem, Museum Brombeek, which has a large collection of, of, say, dubiously acquired colonial objects. And they, they, uh, they made an inventory there. But then there was another thing, which is maybe also typical Dutch. Without the foreign ministry knowing it, the municipality of Amsterdam, which is often a bit more progressive than other, so other authorities in the Netherlands, they invited a delegation of a foundation of Jakarta. And it was some sort of housing foundation. And the, I think the Lord Mayor of Jakarta or the former Lord Mayor, he was part of it. And three of them came to the Netherlands and they arranged, you know, that they could visit all the museums, all public museums with colonial collections, their underground stores, and they made notes, 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 they made photographs, etc. And they made a long list. And at the end of the visit, they had a list of 10,000 objects, and we call that a wish list. And this wish list became the basis for the negotiations in 1975. But if when the Dutch foreign ministry heard about it, they were really upset. They said, you know, why didn't we know about this visit? And secondly, they were worried about the list. Because in the list, there were many, many objects. And, you know, if they would have to struggle with Indonesia, you know, whether uh, to give them back or not, there would be big losses for the Netherlands. And so the, the foreign ministry in the Netherlands started their own investigation, made their own investigation. And in their report, they admitted that private people, colonial officials, military and so, had, you know, acquired unlawful appropriations. And you see here two, I see, I've shown you two Buddha heads. They are both from the Borobudur. And one is in the, the gray one is in the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam. The brown one is in the Tropen Museum. And um, they admitted that private people had acquired objects which they never should have acquired, a matter of smuggling, something like that. And at the same time, at the, uh, you see our foreign minister, Adam Malik, and our foreign minister of the time, Max van der Stoel, they got along quite well. And van der Stoel was, he was in, in Indonesia at the end of 1974. And he thought, well, you know, it's, it's a burning issue in Indonesia and we have to do something in order to, to, to keep the relation well. So that was that. That was the secret mission. Was, and it was the preparation also for the, um, for the negotiations. Then the next slide, please. Um, you know, two, uh, there were two teams. Each government appointed a team of experts with people from archaeology, museums, academics, um, ar archives, um, officials, etc. And they came together in November 75 in Jakarta. They were spent two weeks together doing a lot of socializing, but they were also negotiating. Now these negotiations, they were quite complicated because Indonesia started with a list of 10,000 objects and the Netherlands started with an offer. Well, you know, we are willing to, to return a few things, but not so many. 
So, you know, the, there was no progress in the whole thing. And at a certain moment, the two parties didn't know what to do. And then something happened, you know, which sometimes helps in this sort of negotiations. They, the two delegations, the two team of sec, teams of experts, they went to the Minister of Education and Culture, Mr. Tayeb. And Mr. Tayeb said, 10,000, you know, where, do I, where can I keep them, you know? And that was a breakthrough when the minister said, this is too difficult. And then the short list of the Netherlands was accepted. And the two parties came to joint recommendations concerning cultural cooperation in the field of museum and archives, including the transfer of objects. Now, I've written down here a few um, of the, the, the stipulations from a few recommendations. One is, you know, the, the return of the Prajna Paramitra, a part of the pieces of the Lombok treasure, and objects related to national heroes, such as Dipunagor. And among these objects was the Chris, which, which nobody knew where it was. And the Netherlands also helped, promised to help locate non-state processes, such as Buddha heads coming from the Borobudur temple complex. So that was quite interesting. These joint recommendations were accepted by both sides, but the Netherlands did not really implement them. The next slide, please. Because what they did not do, you know, they never tried to find until recently the Chris of Dipunagoro. They never encouraged private owners, for instance, of these Buddha heads of the Borobudur or other statues to, to reconsider their possession and maybe to return to Indonesia. And they also, in the joint recommendations, they had said, we, are, we have to decide who is the owner of the Java men, you know, the old Java men from, from, from Java, you know, very old fossils. And so there were several things that, uh, several appointments that the Netherlands had missed, it had not done anything. Now, as many of you might know, in um, uh, March last year, all at once, there was a press release from the Dutch Ministry of Culture saying that the Chris of Dipunagoro had been found and had been returned. Now, I want to say a few words about this Chris, because, you know, the Chris, it was always there and it was not there. You know, it had popping up and disappearing and no one really knew how it looked like and what it was. But twice, a Dutch ambassador in Jakarta in the 1980s suggested to return the Chris to Indonesia. Once in 1984, the director of, of Museum Volkenkunde, the Ethnographic Museum in Leiden, thought he had found it. In the 1990s, Queen Beatrix, when she was, went on a state visit to Indonesia, it was suggested to her to take the Chris back to Indonesia. But then the, um, the assistants of museum, the ethnographic museum in Leiden, they said, oh, we cannot find it. They could not find it. And then, but in fact, the museum at that time was uncooperative in enabling researchers to look for the Chris. You know, I, I experienced it myself. I approached them several times, you know, do you really not have it? But then, you know, the atmosphere was changing through the years. And in 2017, the museum decided to reopen the search for the KISS, you know, under pressure of the media, academic world, and also because of their own ethics were changing. And then it still took two and a half years to find it, whereas it was in their own underground stores. And when it was transferred to Indonesia, the Dutch Ministers for Culture argument was compliance with an international agreement. Now, so far about the, the 1970s return. Now we turn to the 2010s, the next slide, please. And that's a very different story. You know, most um, colonizers, they had their own educational institutions for future colonial officials. The Netherlands had one in Delft, in the city of Delft, the Indische Instelling. And it had many teachers, many students. And when they went to, to the Dutch Indies or to Indonesia, they sent back objects which they found in their, they bought at markets or maybe they, 
They stole them, we don't know. And they send them back. And quickly, the museum, the, the institution, got a very large collection of objects. And it set up a specific museum for it. The Museum Nusantara. And the Delft municipality was the owner of it. It's important. In 1901, the educational institution was stopped, but the museum continued to exist. And it consists, and it has continued for over a century. But in 2012, Delft Museum, Delft Municipality decided to close the museum. You know, the Delft was in big financial trouble, so they had to cut down the budget on culture. And the number of visitors was not increasing anymore, you know, and you know, people didn't really know what is the future of this museum. And then there was the problem. The next slide, please. The problem was that you know, this museum they had 18,000 objects, mostly from the Dutch East Indies. They had thousands of photographs and books, all in all, some 40,000 items. And then the problem is where do we find a new home for these objects? especially. And the, the, the interesting thing at that time, which was at that time, it was rather progressive 20, 2013, was that the municipality said, repatriate as many objects to Indonesia as possible. And the Museum Nusantara, you know, engaged the Ethnographic Museum in Leiden to help, you know, to, to get rid of these 18,000 objects. And they had, they had this apart, you know, they had these two aims in their mind. They wanted to keep the whole collection in the public domain, in public museums, and not to let it go to, to auction houses because then it would disappear and to repatriate as many as possible. But, you know, there, are, there were some very serious obstacles. And that is, you know, of the over, I think there were 18,576 objects, something like that. You know, not all of them could go to Indonesia. So there was, for instance, 500 objects. They were returned to people who had donated or given them on a long-term loan. That was one. There were objects of which Delft City said, well, this is our heritage. It's, it's related to the Dutch East India Company. Delft was a, a chamber of the Dutch East India Company, and we want to keep them here. But there was another problem, and that's the Dutch heritage law. And that stipulates that before a museum deaccessions an object, it has to be de determined whether it belongs to the Dutch national collection. And when you know some of the curators, they were charged to find out which of these objects were part of the Dutch collection. Um, and they said they they said, well, maybe ten percent, maybe eighteen hundred or something. But when they started to work. It turned out to be almost 3,200. So that was a large, a large cut in, in the whole collection. And there were some other. Can, can I have the next slide, please? Now, then you see what the, the communication between Delft and Indonesia, I, I think it's very fascinating, fascinating. Initially, the Director General, for, the then Director General for Culture, Katrin Marian, and Museum National, they were enthusiastic about the Dutch repatriation officer. And a delegation came to Delft and an oral agreement was concluded. Photos were made and Delft put the agreement on paper and sent it to Jakarta for a signature, but then no reaction came. And a few months later, the new director general, Hilmar Farid, he sent a brief message rejecting Delft's repatriation offer. And in the Netherlands, we were wondering what is happening, you know, because the, the director general had not indicated the reason for not accepting it. But what we felt, and just listening here and in Jakarta, you know, I found that probably, but maybe um, Helma Fried wants to react on that later, Indonesia had to accept the remaining collection in its totality. So it was everything or nothing. And it also had to pay for the transport from Delft to Jakarta, which is quite, quite a lot of money. Indonesia was maybe upset since the best item items would remain in the Netherlands and you know the leftovers so-called would be for them and most objects had very little documentation so what would be the value for Indonesia 
And of course, there were storage problems. You know, to if you have to put somewhere fifteen thousand objects, it is really it is very very hard. So then, after this reaction, the next slide, please. There was a confusing situation because Delft had to restart the deaccessioning anew. It put thousands of objects on a database and enabled museums in the Netherlands to choose objects. Then for, for the remaining objects, it approached museums in Europe and Asia. And in the meantime, but not everybody knew that, the, the Ministry of Culture and the Museum National and the people in the Netherlands, they had to remain in touch with each other. And, you know, there were, there was some diplomatic talks, you know, some pressure from here and there. And that finally resulted in a wish at the Indonesian side to get back 1500 objects maximum. And they had to be selected by Indonesia themselves. And, you know, and this is what happened. And there was much relief in Leiden and in Delft and Leiden because, you know, the initial aim of repatriation at least was, was reached for a certain extent. And as a token on the picture, you see that our Prime Minister Mark Rutte hands over an ancient Bugini's crease to President Joko Widodo. But there were also worries as museums in the Netherlands, Europe, Asia and Asia were redirected to the waiting room. The next slide, please. So finally, they, there was this agreement. And if you look, you know, if you have to find new homes for 18,000 objects, it's really a complicated thing. You know, finally, they went to, apart from what went to Museum National in Jakarta, to nine museums in the Netherlands, two in Europe, and three in Asia. So the, the objects were kept in the public domain, but the bigger part of the collection did not go to Indonesia. And remarkably, the biggest receiver became the Asia Cultural Center, Center in Gwangju in South Korea with almost 50% of the total collection. And it's clear that if you want to do a deaccessioning, a return, a restitution, you know, it takes time, it takes money, and it takes personnel. Now, let me go to the lessons, the last slide, please. And I jump immediately to the last one because I think my time is almost over. You know, what struck me in the, um, in the, in the repatriation of the Nusantara collection is that Indonesia was not so much interested in the way we had acquired, the Netherlands had acquired these objects, you know, whether they were tainted objects, whether they had been, you know, taken against the will and without compensation of the original owners. They were much more interested in what they needed. They said, you know, we have certain gaps in our museums and we look for objects to fill those gaps. Now that differs from what other countries in the South are doing. You know, they're more after undoing, in, undoing injustice. If you look at China, Nigeria, the Benin Kingdom to Ethiopia, etc then you see they are, they are still angry about the injustice. For Indonesia, that seems to be different. You know, and I think one of the main issues between in these negotiations has to do with equality. Are you able to, to, to dialogue as equal partners? And what has to be done to be, for becoming equal partners? That's really hard. And finally, I would like to say that, of course, return is about objects, about human remains and archives, but it is also a recognition of injustices from the past. The aim of return is also to heal a relationship, to return dignity, to restore trust, or maybe to diminish distrust and to reduce inequality. I would like to leave it to that. Thank you very much. Unmute yourself. Oh, uh, yeah, issue in Zumbo, yes. Uh, yeah, so thank you just for very insightful um, comments and presentations and uh, in comparing the returns of uh, from the Netherlands to Indonesia in the 1970s and, 19, and 2010s. A lot of interesting facts uh, that 
could be further discussed. But uh, before that, uh, let's switch our discussion uh, forward to the futures. Uh, at least from the from the Indonesian side, uh, we would like to hear what sort of considerations and platform are being discussed right now to end gender restitutions and to Indonesia want every object back in the country. Pahilmar, over to you. Um, thank you, uh, Panga. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate you and all of the authors of that excellent collection of essays. Um, I actually read it uh, before uh, this seminar. And also thank you, Jos, um, for providing a historical outline of the repatriation uh, program since the Roundtable um, Conference in 1949. Uh, I actually, I read your dissertation as well. It's very useful. And um, thank you also for your email updates. Um, they're very, very helpful. So um, I'm gonna focus on the um, returning of objects from the Nusantara Museum in Delft, uh, since Jos has already talked about that. So I'm going to provide a, a few details, like additional details uh, to the story. And um, also about the Christi Ponogoro uh, that was, um, uh, last year, and um, the third part would be about what we are going to do now. Um, we have established a committee in response to the um, new uh, program from the Dutch government uh, about returning of uh, objects um, from uh, museums in, in, in the Netherlands. So uh, let me start with, uh, with this basic um, um, idea of the return of objects. Yeah? Because sometimes these objects, uh, for many of us who are working in the museum sector and the cultural sector, they're objects that belong to a, a museum collection. But um, if you look at, um, at the biographies of these objects, um, sometimes they have like different values and meanings for the original owners no? and their descendants, of course, um, for ritual purposes, um, other cultural purposes, um, so they are not necessarily museum objects as we understand them, no? So, and um, there have been concerns um, in the uh, public debate about the returning of the objects, both in Indonesia and I think in, in the different uh, parts of the world as you um, document very well in that uh, collection of essays. So there have been concerns uh, among the ear of these objects. Um, if they are going to be returned to Indonesia, where are they? Um, be placed a, a national museum or are they are going back to the original owners, the rightful owners and all these discussions, no? So really it's not simply about objects, but it's about history, historical injustice, um, cultural identity, national identity, etc. no? And here we deal really with some fundamental important questions uh, to whom are we actually returning these objects, yeah? Of course, we can say like simply to the rightful owner, but who is that? The Indonesian state, yeah. Um, it didn't exist when most of these objects were taken. Um, and these objects may have different meanings for the state, the people, the descendants of the original owners, et cetera, et cetera. So what is needed here? Research, you no, know? but by whom? Yeah. Provenance research is one but we also need to think really about these difficult issue, issues that I, I, I mentioned above, yeah? And uh, you, I think we have to involve like interdisciplinary um, um, uh, approaches you know, to really uh, look at these uh, issues like thoroughly. So let me start with the Delft Nusantara Museum. Um, I think um, what I outlined before about these difficult issues um, to be discussed, that was absent during the return of the um, collections from the Nusantara Museum. Uh, for your information, I know this, uh, the, the Delft Nusantara Museum by heart. Actually, when I was a child, I used to spend my holiday at the museum. Yeah, my aunt actually worked there for many, many years. So I know the collection like quite well as a child, of course. Um, and uh, I, I, I've been following the news that when the museum was closed in 2013, uh, by the city of Delft in April 2014, it decided to split up the collection between different museums in the Netherlands. And only in October 2015, our staff were actually contacted to discuss this. So it was not part of a restitution uh, process. No? 
um, the museum wanted to give away the collection because the museum was closed, you know, to find a new home, like Jos uh, said like earlier. And initially it offered 18,000 objects. And that was the first meeting, yeah? It went down to 15,000 objects in the second meeting, and then down to 11,000 objects in the third meeting. And little information was provided about the collection itself, yeah? Our staff later on like approached the Museum for, of uh, Museum Falkenkunde um, for some information. They got for some of the uh, items in the collection, but not everything. Um, so what I understand that, uh, that providing information about these objects, where they are from, what they actually mean, and et cetera, et cetera, was absent. You know? It was not really part of the process. So I came in in January 2016, uh, and what I saw at that time that we were not standing at on, on an equal footing. Yeah, that was my conclusion. Yeah, from the reports that were received from my staff. And I thought that this was not good. Yeah, and the number of items in the collection kept dwindling because of the new law in 2016, as just has uh, <coughs> mentioned earlier. Um, and finally down to 1500 objects from 15,000, uh, 18,000, sorry, yeah. So, and on top of that, Indonesia was to pay for the storage where the, uh, where the collection was kept, you know, uh, after the museum was closed. So my initial reaction was, of course, no. Yeah. Why would you? Yeah. And it's not a repatriation process, as you said uh, before. There was no discussion about what these collections, uh, where the items actually come from, how they were um, acquired at that time, et cetera, et cetera. So all these fundamental questions, were absent um, during the return of the objects. Yeah. It was more like a gift, yeah. uh, return to Indonesia <clears throat> from the collection, which is nice. I, I have I, um, no group has no objection of the 1500 uh, items that were later on returned. Actually, we created a very beautiful um, um, exhibition out of that. But in, our context, in the context of our discussion today, yeah, the repatriation and all these difficult uh, questions about decolonizing museums, that was not really the case. Yeah, it was a different uh, issue altogether. Second, the Christi Ponogoro. Similarly, we were approached several weeks uh, before the Chris was actually returned to Indonesia. Provenance research was already conducted by the Museum Falkenkunde, where the Chris was actually kept. Yeah, and as you just mentioned earlier, uh, they were for um, several years, if not decades, uh, they were not able to find that Chris or decide which one was actually the Chris of Tipnogor. No? Um, the last provenance research, a well-written research, I read the research, I talked to the researchers and all that. Um, some Indonesians were involved, a creator from, the, uh, from Austria, Indonesian residing in Austria was already, already also invo uh, involved in the provenance research. I discussed some of the findings were there. So it was good research, no? Um, but um, uh, to be honest, the ministry was not involved. Yeah. We were already given the final result, the conclusion of the provenance research later on. Yeah. Like several weeks before the actual uh, returning of the, um, um, of the uh, Chris. So um, um, no discussion. Yeah, about what this Chris actually uh, meant to Indonesia. Yeah, um, and actually the interesting discussion took place after return, after the return, of, yeah, not before. Yeah, um, a very uh, interesting question was raised by the public: Is is this really the Chris of Tipunogoro that was like missing for for uh, for several decades? No, um, of course I I trust um, the a conclusion of the research is rare written uh, and basically it concludes that from the available documentation um, the conclusion could only be that this is actually the case of it yeah there was a letter from uh, Raden Saleh signifying that um, quoting uh, Santo Talibasha um, uh, information from Santo Talibasha and so on so all the details were there I'm convinced I was convinced yeah everyone else in the team was convinced that yes this is the case but that took place after the return of the object. No? So this brings me to the third part or the conclusion of, of, of what I'm going to say. Uh, so what are we, doing, uh, are we uh, going to do now? Yeah, well, we start with research. 
Yeah, we conduct research. Let's determine together which object should be our focus. And I'm not talking about quality of the um, uh, of the, of the items in the collection, yeah, but um, it's more for me. Um, it's not simply about returning of objects. It is about knowledge production. Yeah, it is about rewriting of history. It's about dealing with past injustices. So that's where I uh, would locate the discussion of returning of the objects, and um, I'm going to share a few slides with you. Um, sorry. It'll take a while. Okay. So this is from the uh, Nusantara Museum. Yeah. Tongkat Malehat. So some of them are well documented. We have all the information about the objects, but not um, um, about how they were actually acquired. Uh, it was more about like after um, it was donated to the museum or after it, it, it arrived in the Netherlands. Uh, so that's where the story of most of these objects actually start, uh, including this. Yeah. And as you can see that, yeah, we were not involved yeah, in the entire process. And this is what we are going to do now. Yeah, we sit together and we define which objects would be of interest in Indonesia, like considering all these important basic fundamental questions that I mentioned before. Yeah, and start from there. Yeah, this will take many, many years. Yeah to actually uh, make some progress. So anyone who was more interested in the amount of things that are going to be returned might be disappointed. Because for me, this is an ongoing uh, thing. It's also not simply about like historical research and so on. It's about a, um, a relationship between people of different cultures and countries. Yeah. It is about the common um, understanding of the past yeah, a common position about yeah our current situation and also about the future. So it's part of a of a much larger process. Yeah, um, and I think it's important for us uh, really to uh, start for something from something concrete. Yeah, like this Indische Flag um, uh, was, of course, uh, it um, we are familiar with Mayor uh, Christopher Frederick Koch. Yeah, from the Aceh War um, back in the uh, 19th century, early 20th century. So you can uh, guess how the flag actually arrived in the Netherlands and what it meant to people in the past. It is, I mean, if you look at the flag itself, it's probably not the most interesting, um, a beautiful aesthetically object in the collection. But I think for many, uh, people here, it's important to really understand um, what it signified in the past. So these are kind of objects that we are interested in. No? And Wayang Beber, of course, beautiful as always. Yeah. So it's a combination of all these things yeah, that I think uh, is really important for us to uh, consider, yeah, to have um, uh, people who are interested in uh, um, uh, um, in museum collections, um, history, um, culture in general, that should be involved in the uh, process of the discussion. So I, I thank you for organizing this, but I really hope that uh, we can also extend our discussion um, to a larger audience uh, to really get response from them. Because during the um, exhibition of the Nusantara Museum uh, collection, and also the Chris Diponogoro, that was in October 2019, um, we got really interesting responses. Yeah? I can tell you from the Chris Diponogoro. There was, so there was a small group of students, high school students, teens actually, you know, went to the exhibition. They were inspired by that. Yeah, they went back to their school, and like weeks after that, they called me up. Yeah? 
can we actually organize something about Christi Pondogoro? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, and I thought this was just like a small uh, group of high school students interested in history. But um, actually they managed to organize an online discussion about, uh, about this and 1000 students actually attended that. Yeah, all interested in different parts, uh, different aspects, dimensions of the Chris. So not really about history itself, but yeah, to with, with, with their like own creative, uh, imaginative questions. And this is, I think, for me, what is probably the most important part of doing this. Yeah, that it actually can inspire a generation um, about history, about past wrongdoings, about how to deal with all these like past injustices and how to think about a better future. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, and thank you, Banga, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you, Pailmar, for a very interesting uh, talk and also for highlighting the need for equal dialogue uh, in the process of restitution or object restitution in the future as well. Uh, we will have a discussion for now, uh, but uh, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, put them in the Q&A box. We will um, address them. But after we have the response from our discussion, Siang Soka. Uh, so to discuss some of the issues that are raised by the both speakers and also to provide comparison with the perspective from Cambodia, I would like to invite Soka to also give his response, uh, short response. Uh, Soka, do you want to chime in now? All right. Uh, it's okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Banga, for your talk. <clears throat> okay. Uh, rather than sorry, I will not have slide, so we just talk. So uh, rather than con. <clears throat> uh, So rather than, like Manga said, rather than continue talking about the restitution story in Indonesia, here I would like to talk about such issue in Cambodia so that the audience can have a comparative view on the issue in both countries. Uh, I have a really short time, so I'm going to focus here on what I consider as a, a kind of battle, a battle or narrative, a topic I believe to be very important when it comes to restitution of cultural object to the con country of the origin. So uh, first, uh, let me give you an overview of how the object was taken out of Cambodia, which can be divided into two periods. Uh, the first is colonial period from uh, uh, 1863 to 1954. The second is post-colonial period or after independence, which lasts until now. Uh, the colonial period can be divided further in, into at least two groups, one, one of which were objects that were collected by colonial officers, such as Louis de Laporte or French resident or tourist researcher, French institution, and so on. Uh, these objects are still currently in the museum or private collection in France, especially in the Guimet Museum. The other group, it, it's those objects that uh, were put on sale in Cambodia by the French authority to tourists and overseas institutions during the 1920s and 1940. At first, these objects were supposed to be those of less important value. Uh, for example, a broken piece, a piece of arm, and so on. The purpose was to let the world know about the Khmer culture and at the same time kind of preventing the trafficking of important piece. Unfortunately, it got out of hand. A few masterpieces were in up, in up uh, being sold to institute abroad, such as uh, the bus of Hewaja currently displayed at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of, of Art in New York. Uh, there has never been any discussion on the legality of export of the exportation of this object from Cambodia during the colonial period, which account for a few hundred of masterpieces. On the other hand, the object that were taken from the country during 
the post independent, which could be hundreds of thousands, both large and small, most of them can be considered outright looted object from the country during this difficult time. Uh, unlike uh, uh, Indonesia, we, we see the return of many objects taken out from, uh, from the country during the Dutch colonial period. There has been no object returned to Cambodia from the French colonial period. So far, only five or 600 pieces looted from the post-independent that have been returned. And this number probably account to lesser than 1% of what probably had been lost. So uh, why can we have never tried to ask a friend for the return of the cultural object? There are probably several reasons for that. I could think of at least three important reasons. So one is the persistent colonial narrative of Onko where many, many objects were taken. The second is the agency to urgency to hail the loot object of the post-independent and, uh, and to, to protect what we have still have in the country. And another one is uh, the legal difficulty in, in you know, as for the return of the object. Okay, now is anyone who is familiar, so I'm going to start talking about narrative. So now, if anyone who is familiar with Uncle, you probably learn from various media book whether it is in French, English, Thai, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, whatever. All those, all those media keep repeat the same story. Onko was discovered by Henri Mo. And recently some scholars use the term rediscovery instead of discovery. This is because some Europeans have arrived and made the record about Onko before Mo. The term discovery and rediscovery narrative give the perception that Onko was abandoned, forgotten, hidden and lost. This is not true, but it's still a prevailing narrative among almost everyone. Such narrative was intentionally made by the French colonial researcher and authority. There are several evidence to prove that, for example, in the very work of Henri Moreau, supposedly the French discoverer of Onko, some of his drawings were excluded. These drawings are the local inhabitants and home at the site in Onko. An American who arrived before Mo'o even took some photograph of a village in Angkor Wat Temple itself. And also various name of the temple at the site itself were not a new name given, given to the temple by the friend or the Khmer in the 19th century. For example, Bakang, which located in the very center of Angkor was an old name recorded in the, in the 16th century and continued being used until today. Uh, there's just a few examples that show that Onko was never a forgotten or abandoned or hidden or lost place or capital as uh, claimed by colonial narrative. However, by using these terms such as forgotten, discover, not only it romanticized or stirred the Western public imagination of the site in, in the 19th century, actually even now, it also gives friends the credit the one who discovered Cambodia's last glory past. And during it, it almost 100 year of control of Cambodia, several local institutions such as that of Buddhist Institute, which supervised by the friend, translate into Khmer several friend research work, emphasize such narrative, which resulting in that, that uh, the narrative, the, 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 the abandoned capital was uh, to the not only Cambodian intellectual but also to the common people. To give you an example of just, of just how uh, successful this narrative is, a phrase in our national anthem, which our kids have to sing every morning and evening, is that stone temple hidden in the forest. This is referred to exactly on Wat, the narrative that friends try during their control of Cambodia. The song was composed in the last year of French colonization in Cambodia by a famous Khmer monk, Chuanat. Uh, so for Cambodia, we uh, somehow we don't, we, we, we do not, we, we don't really reason the French colonization that might probably all claim to not, uh, that kind of narrative that the French discovered of our glory past and another narrative which the friend is the savior of 
Cambodia during its weakness, which is sandwiched by two powerful and expanding neighbor, Vietnam and Thailand during the 17th and 18th century, and also the local leader which embraced the French culture after the independence. There is, however, a blip about anti-French in Cambodian media around 1960, such as a novel based on fact called The Beast Village, narrating the cruelty of French tax collector. Uh, unfortunately, anti-past colonial power rarely started in Cambodia as it went through other unfortunate circumstances in the American Vietnamese War, and after that coup d'etat, and after that genocide, after that Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia, and after that civil war, which lasts until 1998, around 20 years ago. So during this post-colonial period that we saw many cultural objects looted from the country. So after stabilization, Cambodia has to first all protect what are left in the country, not an easy task considering the lack of human resource, lack of fund, and extensive fire and property to be protected. So, and in the last two decades, Cambodia has involved in a lot of missions to recover the loot object during the post independent uh, back home. Uh, so, uh, from, from this perspective, the tracer at home and the loot tracer in market are obviously more urgent and important to protect or claim back than those objects taken during the colonial period, which we know where they are. Uh, regarding the legal process, it is very difficult battle. It, it's difficult for Cambodia to win any of that. It, it is resource intensive, expensive, and time consuming. It is very likely that we cannot win through the court because we do not have written record or evidence of provenance, also the case. And that is why Cambodia prefer strategy of one diplomacy, which we ask destinate country of our loot object to have through various agreements, for example, with the United States in recent years. They help Cambodia a lot in finding those objects, suing and seizing the object without proper document on behalf of Cambodia. They did ask Cambodia to show the provenance when the object Dim uh, when the object uh, that, that <coughs> so, sorry, uh, to show, uh, they, they, they did ask Cambodia to show uh, the prominence so that they can return it. Most of the time, we cannot sh show prominence. But because of good cooperation and intention to help from the, from the US, they still return it regardless. Uh, this, the second strategy is to negotiate. So uh, with the private collector, which has always been quite successful in encouraging the return of our object. One in a while, there's a ceremony and photo op showing the return of the object to the museum with the Cambodian deputy minister or minister come you know, to, to join the ceremony. Uh, just to be clear though, uh, I do not mean that the legal process or court process is impossible. It is just difficult to achieve and consider hundreds of thousands of objects out there. Mostly we do not have documents. It is difficult to fight for, for the government. For example, regarding the Sotheby case, the famous case. Sometimes people think that the Cambodian government sued them to return those objects. That's not necessarily true. We did bring them to the court, but it never concluded. They gave up. Before Sotheby gave up, several museums in the US gave up the object in their position, which come from the same place. And those museums worry about their reputation. It would be very difficult to find a moral and ethical ground to keep displaying this object in their gallery as the case has been brought to light and everyone discussed about it. And when the museum, the US museum gave up, their position to uphold their principle, this put a lot of pressure on Sotheby to do the same. So, so to me, a successful restitution story is not based on a strong or powerful legal battle against everyone who possess our object legally or illegally. It's more of a narrative battle which could be assisted by diplomacy, negotiation, and media. 
without the narrative that the object in several US museums were bloody statues, I have very much doubt that they would willingly return them. Okay, uh, finally, um, I would like to bring everyone back to the command object at the Guimet Museum, which is collected during the colonial period. I'm sorry to, to, to the staff at the, music, the Guimet Museum, but I had to put, that, put all of them on the spot here and at any opportunity I have. For several years now, the Guimet Museum has tried to present the collection activity of the object from Cambodia as positive or even glorifying it, especially by Louis de Laporte. In a series of special exhibitions such as Encore the Birth of a Meat, the Visual Report and Cambodia, we, uh, so we, rather than talk about the object, it narrative was to show off how amazing and heroic the Visual Report was when collecting the Khmer object. I perceive this personally as an effort to pre induce try again, reason trend in restitution by Western countries to its former colony. The purpose was to view a moral and ethical ground for Ime Museum to stand on in displaying its object, not legal, but ethical and moral ground. So not to fall into dilemma of the museum in the US I mentioned earlier. Here are some of the quotes from recent publication of the researcher from the, the Gime, I will not say who. So for example, collecting, statue, collecting statuary was not then illegal according to colonial regulation. I doubt that. He, he can spin it whatever he wants. And another one, for example, the object has no value. So collecting them was okay. So this is referring to the, the, the previous colonial narrative about uncle as a place, as an abundant place. That's why I, I, I mentioned it earlier about it. So how, how was the object has no value? So from my perspective, that because the Guimet researcher does not understand the Khmer culture. Regarding this temple, the Khmer did not think of them in terms of monetary value. They thought of it as a spiritual place, not to be disturbed, not to be touched without justified reason. That's why some temples were less untouched because they are our spirit, ancestor, ghost, God, and so on. And in fact, several of them were not left alone. People live in that area. I hope the friend researcher at the Guimet stopped this, this re, it, it disregard the Khmer people living there in the past and now. And we are living in a different world. We are not living in the 19th century. So please stop that. It is an opportunity to reconcile, not to impose another will or narrative. Another quote from the staff of the museum. Louis de Laporte got permission from the Khmer King to collect objects from Uncle Wat. That is true. Nothing as a Cambodian we can do to argue against that. But I would like to remind everyone that when the Khmer King did not agree to another friend demand, in approximately the same year, 1984, gunboat and friend gunsmen were sent to the Royal Palace to force the king to sign. Too much of an agreement, you ask me. And it is also important to mention that simply our uncle, where, where uncle is, back then was not even under the jurisdiction of the Khmer king. It was under the, the Thai king, so dismissed this, this made this agreement illegal. So to fix that, recently another published work, the same researcher stated, Louis de Laporte made an oral agreement with the Thai and the British on the spot at the time without any quotation. It's just an assumption to justify the collection. So for the local, it is clearly demonstrated in, even in the note of Louis de Laporte himself that the monk who lived at the site did not agree to the collection. But then again, Louis de Laporte went to Simbrip with agreement from the Khmer King, gunboat and military jetsonet. All right, uh, finally, just for the context, even the place, the Simbrip place was under the Thai jurisdiction at the time. When the Thai King, in, in the 1850, several years before Mo'od and Louis de Laporte sent 300 laborers 
and his servant to dismantle the temple to transport them back to Bangkok. All of them were massacred. All of them were killed. That's why King Mun Kut decided to instead to make a small replica of Angkor Wat, which is placed in the Thai Royal Palace until today. So uh, that so the, the point I try to make is it's uh, I'm concerned about the narrative, the sort this this sort of narrative that is kind of like go against the trend. And I think we should, I mean like. Everyone, I mean, if you, you work in Southeast Asia, you on the on the this Southeast Asian side, you should keep your eye on because this sometimes it goes very quietly, silently. And and at one point everyone going to keep repeat it. Repeat until it becomes uh ubiquitous, like like repeat until it like it's fact, just like the narrative about the 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 abandoned uh, uh, capital of uncle or the, the friend discovered and stuff like that. So thank you. That's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Soka, for uh, such a fairy comments and also such for highlighting the, uh, the, the, the importance of narrative actually. And uh, you mentioned about the narrative of loss and abandonment and also, of course, um, that kind of narrative is also uh, present in Indonesia right now, particularly uh, relating to the uh, narrative for uh, ancient Hindu Buddhist uh, temples and materials that sort of become the uh, the the main reason for for the uh, Dutch colonizer at the time in the colonial period to 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 collect or to just accumulate all these objects from Indonesia and take back to Europe right now. Uh, so just to further this discussion on the narrative, then I'm gonna start taking questions from the attendees uh, and I'm going to start by uh, taking question for Pai Hilmar actually uh, uh, on the question of to whom we are returning objects and there is a question by Sadia Bunstra. Sadia asks uh, in making the selection returning objects to uh, Indonesia who gets to decide what is important for whom within Indonesia who gets to speak for whom in making these selections and how to make this process as inclusive as possible. So, Pailmar? Well, thank you, Sadia. Um, as inclusive as you want to be, um, of course, there are limitations, right? I mean, um, you have to go like through representations of, of representatives of, of, of voices. Um, the good thing here uh, in Indonesia is that I've um, received um, questions, um, also uh, um, ideas uh, from uh, different parts uh, of the country. Um, some of them claim, claiming to be the original uh, owners or descendants of the original owners, some alleged general public. So it's, it's, it's pretty much alive. Um, uh, we have formed a committee uh, that will um, look into the provenance research um, and to decide like which objects are going to be returned at all. Uh, and um, they are now engaged um, in um, smaller uh, discussions with um, experts, uh, representatives of civil society organizations and all that. Um, I cannot claim that this is already like inclusive enough. Uh, we want to do more, of course. Um, but I think uh, with the course of time, uh, we are going to open up um, this process uh, to make it more transparent, so to say, um, and organize like uh, public discussions about that um, by focusing on um, several issues that I raised before in my presentation. No? So, um, but uh, to make it work, I think uh, we really have to um, like focus on, on several issues, objects, and really to see the dynamics that uh, will um, follow from that uh, process. Otherwise you would end up trying to do too many things at the same time, trying to involve too many people at the same time and that, yeah. Um, and then degenerate into make it unmanageable. You know? So that's, more or less the approach that we are going to do. Um, I hope that uh, answered your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bayomar. Uh, 
I think just want to respond to that uh, comment as well. But before uh, I went to Josh, I go to Josh. I want to just throw in another question from the attendees. Uh, this one from Heidi Tan. Uh, because when we talk about narrative, of course, uh, and we if we want to make it as inclusive as possible, of course, our basis would be the provenance uh, of the object itself. And that's become the basis of the fundamental basis of how we, then we uh, tell the stories about the objects, the, the provenance that uh, we should do uh, for the uh, collected object. So Heidi uh, asked about uh, this kind of uh, collaborative research uh, about provenance and how then uh, this collaborative research is geared towards uh, exhibition that focus on quote, uh, beautiful unquote objects and that the, process, that the process itself ends with the exhibition. So how can then the archival uh, research be sustained over the longer terms? How can database be shared after that? And then is pandemic a good opportunity to recalibrate our thinking about archival documentation and provenance research? And I think just has done many archival research in the past before uh, highlighting all this interesting fact in the in his uh, lecture before this. So I just want to have uh, his comment as well on this uh, matter. And also maybe after that, I will go to Soka also because uh, he also has worked in the uh, registration and inventory office in the National uh, Museum of Cambodia. So first, Josh, please. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I, I would like to go back to the, to whom question, because you know if if Europe is willing to make a move, then the next question is the to whom question. And um, I was very encouraged by a seminar a few weeks ago in which Professor um, Schiem Margono participated. He is a member of the committee, and he spoke about the same issue, and I was delighted to hear what he was saying. Now, my thought at that time, and, and I want to put that to you, Hilmar, is, um, is, is there not a South-South consultation needed? Because it's a very sensitive issue. It's very complicated. And as far as I can see, in Nigeria, which is not next door to Indonesia, but it's, you know, they, they are in the process of solving it with a, um, a legacy restoration trust in which the federal government, the state government and the Benin Kingdom work together to decide about the future of the Benin objects. And it's the only formal uh, construction that I know of at the moment, which is working. So, but I also think, you know, that it should be a South-South consultation and we should keep out of it. W what is your thought about about it well we have a similar uh, situation here with the uh, um, the palace of karangasam in bali you know? uh, um, there was this like particular object uh, and i actually i was referring although not like directly uh, to that case um since uh, to them it's not a museum object right um it belongs to a part of the regalia and all that so what we are going to do is we include that um, into the uh, list of things that we are going to examine, so to say, you no, know? and then trying to involve, um, of course, representatives uh, from there. Um, if they, I understand there was a um, attachment, if I'm not mistaken, uh, involved in that. But uh, of course, we want to hear directly from the um, um, people of the uh, palace themselves and also representatives from the local government, because if it's going to return or if it goes to the uh, Museum de Era, then it would uh, involve them as well. So uh, through that process, we hope to find patterns that we can actually try to begin to identify, like how to deal with all these difficult questions, if they are put in a um, a real context, no? yeah. um, and I don't have the answer right now because, yeah, the, the discussion has, hasn't actually <laughs> started right there. But um, this is, uh, I think, uh, the direction that we are moving into. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I, I really don't know what 
Margono said before, but no, uh, I it's think it's in the same spirit. Yeah, yes, yeah. so share same yeah. idea. Yeah, but I, I, you were talking about um, you know doing provenance research at an equal level. Yeah, mm. and could you transpose that also to Indonesia itself? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Also, yeah. what I'm thinking because I I understand that in the Netherlands, if people do provenance research together, it's easier to let things go, to let objects go. Because you feel yeah. the emotion, the knowledge, the dedication, exactly. the link yeah. of the other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Soka, any comments on the archival research on your experience on how we how we do it and how we should sustain it in the longer period? I know you have a you have a project now with. Uh, itself as well, an archive. Um, sorry, what your question again? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so there's a question about uh, that the archival research stopped when the presentation of the return objects uh, as exhibition in the country uh, where it belonged. Uh, but then again, how then we sustain uh, archive research into more prolonged time. And then also uh, for the difficulty of actually, is it actually viable to do provenance research both inside Southeast Asia and also in Europe as well, from your experience? So, uh... For for the object that were collected by the by the friend, he probably has much more chance to find a kind or document about it. But uh, if we are talking about the object that were that, that are in the market now, most of them like we, we don't know where they, they come from stuff because they are most of them are were looted or stuff like that. And uh, also, Cambodia was like never got the chance to actually do like documentation, you know, of, of that thousand or one or two or three thousand temples and stuff like that. And it really hard. And so even like some object that uh, um, that we we put on the display, sometimes we just say provenance unknown. So uh, uh, provenance is is really difficult for Cambodians to be honest. So like uh, the case like about uh, the one that the uh, one at the Kokke, that is just very specific case. It's just like very unique case that we somehow managed to trace it, like know where it come from and stuff like that. But most of them we just don't know. That's why we we are more like like Cambodia is more uh, rather than uh, you know if you know the problem and you have evidence it's easier to to take someone to the court to to ask them back and stuff like that. But in Cambodia, no, it, it's not. That's why we prefer negotiation and uh, diplomacy and also put the put the pressure on like media and stuff like that. Okay, thank you, Soka. So, yeah, I'm gonna take up the issue of uh, cooperations uh, agreements, and uh, there's also a question about international policy for repatriations, restitution, and uh, for those who uh, haven't uh, recognized yet, uh, there is a actually a UNESCO convention on 1970 on the uh, Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property. That is uh, sometimes being used by the Cambodian government as well to, to negotiate uh, the return of the objects from abroad to, to Cambodia. The funny thing is that Indonesia has not yet signed that convention. So. My question is actually to Pahilmar. Do you think we need to, Indonesia need to sign that or 
we should explore other alternative and options on the agreement or more bilateral agreement that we saw between Indonesia and the Netherlands. That is more fruitful for you. Well, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is um, looking into that. Um, from their perspective, it's disadvantages. Um, I mean, that's that's what I'm uh, I'm told. We are talking about 1970, right? It is a trafficking convention. Yeah. So that's the response from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay. Okay. So, I guess it's uh, we should Indonesia should explore an uh, alternative then. Than, than using the, the 1970 convention. So um, I'm gonna take question again from the Q&A box. Um, there's one question directed to just uh, mainly, but the, uh, the restitution of uh, history collection and human remains. And maybe you could, could you probably provide uh, examples of that? I know that you, in, in the, in the uh, in your presentation, you talk about the fossils from, I believe, from Yen Dubois. Yeah, from it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that hasn't been returned by the Netherlands to Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, but can you, uh, uh, can you probably provide examples of uh, yeah. kind of human remains that have been returned yeah. from other countries? Well, I think in general, um, museums and institutions in Europe are more advanced in the repatriation of human remains than in the repatriation of objects. So it's the opposite as, as if I have understood the question well in the, in the chat box. Um, and why is it? Because they, you know, after the Second World War, when we had this, had this horrible Holocaust, we just started to rethink about racist theories, which had been practiced by Germany. And we felt that they were in some way akin to what we had been doing in the, in all the in all the colonial possessions, you know, taking skulls and and body parts, whole bodies, and so, and and in a very disrespectful way. So already in in 1951, UNESCO accepted a new definition of race, you know, and they said there's only one race, there are no racial differences. So trying to get rid of all forms of racism, and through the years there have been a number of quite important um, repatriations of human remains. And I think the best organized, again, you know, is, is, in the, is from New Zealand. You know, they're after tattooed Maori heads. And I know that in, in the Netherlands, um, um, in 2005, one Maori head was returned and in 2019, the second one, I think there are no other ones. But why is it successful? The same, you know, because there is a close cooperation between the national government, the national museum, and the Maori communities. And they have really defined their roles. And it took a long time to do that because it was complicated for all sorts of reasons. But they also, they, now they have a very ambitious project, you know, in getting back all these Maori heads. The same for Australia, you know, where. Aboriginal groups are really playing their role in repatriation efforts. So, you know, what, what I like about Hilmar's presentation is that Indonesia really has a policy. And what I miss in Cambodia is, you know, we have a policy. And what we need, I mean, if we want to advance with repatriation, we need strong counterparts, very strong counterparts who are well organized and who have a policy who have priorities, you know, and then you can talk with the other sides. And if you do it, like you see them, I expect that this year or next year, the first Benin objects will go back to Nigeria. Now, Hilma, you, you're making a priorities, you know, what, what are our needs? And what, and from that part, we are going to ask the Netherlands, for instance, you know, for repatriation. The, and that's what we need. So my answer, I'm giving two answers to two questions, in fact, but sorry. But you know, there are, there are quite successful repatriations of human remains, particularly to New Zealand and to Australia. The problem with Indonesia is that, you know, we have been so, so greedy trying to get so many that we don't know where they come from. And that's the same for Germany, for instance, you know, which has skulls from, from Tanzania and from Namibia 
and they feel ashamed now because they say, well, we don't know anymore from where they come from. So you cannot return a, a skull which might be from Tanzania and give it back to Namibia. It's very painful. So that's also, you know, why I think that um, in our countries, we need some sort of um, memory places to respect these anonymous people because we will never know their names. Sometimes we know the, the island, Papua, for instance, but not even the region on the island. And we have to respect these people. It's a very poor answer, but that's what I want to say. <laughs> can, I, can I say something to that as well? Yes, uh, to the return of, of, of human remains. Uh, but this is a completely different case. Um, it's the human uh, remains of Japanese soldiers during World War II in Papua. Yeah. No? And um, for the last five years, uh, there has been like uh, research being done, conducted by uh, Japanese uh, scholars uh, working together with uh, uh, people in our office and, uh, and to um, think about ways of returning these human remains. Because as you know, the law in Indonesia says like once it's um, established as a Chagar Budaya, as a heritage that it cannot be uh, transferred um, to cross the borders of Indonesia, no? Um, only for educational research, exhibition purposes and so on. So that was like a delicate question, like how to deal with that, no? Uh, because from my perspective, as I said before, this is about emotions, history, uh, uh, people, like real people and all that. And for um, the Japanese, like descendants of these soldiers, it means a lot you know, to get the remains of their, um, um, of the soldiers back and bring them back to have a proper burial and all that. So um, uh, the way we, we, um, uh, dealt with that issue uh, was also not easy, no? So I'm saying, no, I'm not saying, that, but the, my point is that this is not only a problem in Europe, like even us here in Indonesia, when we, if we are approached. So uh, what I'm trying to say here, that's a, really a, a problem for each um, administration dealing with these issues. No? And it was difficult in Japan uh, because in Papua, uh, the remains of these soldiers, the entire like, complex of the World War II has become kind of a tourist attraction of which the remains are part of that attraction. So if you are now uh, trying to send them back to Japan, it means it will um, separate it from that tourist attraction. It will devalue the tourist attraction itself. No? So from the Papuan perspective is that now, no, we cannot let them bring them back. I mean, it belongs here. And the law says that actually, uh, once it's declared as a cultural heritage, as a Chagar Budaya, then it should stay. You know? And there was a negotiation process. And for me, that, that was a very important process, um, probably much more than the returning of the object themselves. You know? um, because it, it, it brings up a lot of issues um, that um, makes us uh, understand like the complexity of these issues. And of course, there's no um, single solution to that. Uh, we continue doing research and there was, a, of course, like little hiccups here and there because the Papuans were promised by the Japanese families, uh, families from, of, the, of the soldiers that they will be supported, aid provided and all that, that it never <clears throat> um, materialized and the disappointment and then that add, added to the complexity of the problem. So um, we are dealing here with a very um, a real situation in which I think the best of policies, the best of scholarly knowledge uh, would not be able to solve them altogether. Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, our discussion and our approaches here, like be it policy or, or scholarly or otherwise, um, uh, I think would help us to um, think um, about these issues, uh, not to provide a clear solution to that. I mean, the clear solution will, in the end of the day, will be on the ground. Yeah, uh, perspectives and all that, very important, of course, policies, beautiful, but at the, in the end of the day, you have really to, to deal with a lot of <clears throat> and issues and yeah, 
we are dealing with that, then be ready for that. So that is basically a um, uh, point I'd like to make uh, based on the discussion about human remains. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just to respond to your uh, point on dealing with issues that are in the ground, there is a question by Mulaika Hijas in the Q&A box uh, uh, asking about uh, or, or saying a little more about restitution in the context of Central Museum, PRV, regional ones in Indonesia. And uh, she is wondering specifically about the uh, Rio Kugan, which is exhibited at the National Museum, while the Rio Museum has a replica. So is there a demand from the regional authorities for the return of these objects? Not Probably not just Rio Kogan, but also other objects as well that uh, originated from, from, from other provinces like in Jakarta, in National Museum. And what is the central government position for that kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. demand? Yeah, so um, yeah, there have been uh, requests um, from different regional museums um, to exhibit um, items from the collection of the National Museum. No? Uh, sometimes also quest, um, um, demands that uh, they should be returned. But the beautiful thing here uh, in Asia that if it belongs to the state, then it's barang milik negara, it belongs to the state. No? It, the difference only is that where is it actually, um, what is that, the chatat, um, registered, right? Is it registered by the National Museum or Regional Museum? But they are equally barang milik negara. No? So the idea now uh, with the new institutional setting of the National Museum, which has become a BLU, uh, public service um, institution, um, is that uh, we are going to encourage circulation of items in the collection. So they will circulate, yeah? But there will be a single registration for all these barang, museum, uh, barang milik negara. Yeah, the uh, state-owned uh, assets uh, that belong to the state. So uh, in that way, um, we think of the regional museums um, and the national museums as one, right? Uh, so they are all connected. And the idea really is to encourage circulation so that more and more can be displayed because the national museum is limited. Uh, it has more than 200,000 200, items but it doesn't have the space to display them all. Um, I actually calculated that and it, it requires like 150 years uh, really to exhibit everything that we own. So it's impossible basically. Um, so the idea really is to, if we have many of these, like uh, several um, uh, particular collections or items, then we will um, allow them to circulate. Uh, in that way, of course, it will also help um, museums, regional museums to uh, enhance the capacity, institutional capacity and all that when it comes to safety, uh, transporting uh, uh, and, and, and yeah, and so on. So um, that way, I think it, it's, it's, it will help uh, not only uh, to solve or at least to deal with this issue of owning uh, uh, items of in a collection, but also to, yeah, make it more accessible to the general public. Okay, um, thank you, Pailmar. And um, this will be the last issue that we're gonna discuss uh, in the seminar because we are closing up soon, I guess, because of the time. But uh, Pailmar already brought up the issue of uh, access. And of course, uh, repatriating objects to one country and then just put it in the storage, no use at all. Uh, we, we need to provide access to the people so that the object can be of use uh, can be uh, meaningful to them and then can can talk to to the people as well to the community so there's also a question about uh, digital access about uh, digital restitution as well so first of all i would like to uh, ask josh for this uh, for his opinions uh, whether uh, digital restitution is also a way to correct colonial injustice and also inequality, do you think, George? Um, I have great difficulty with this. 
I think digital repatriation is for the documentation about an object. And whether an object is restituted or not is up to the country of origin in dialogue with the country where it is at the moment at an equal level. So, you know, so for a long time, I thought that digital repatriation is favored by people who want to avoid the restitution issue. And they, they don't want to give back, in fact. And I think, you know, again, as I said in my, in my presentation also, what is the purpose of return? The purpose mm -hmm. of return is to heal a relationship that mm -hmm. has been violated. Now, if you, if you do that healing by digital repatriation, it's okay to me, but then you need the, the, the approval of both sides and especially of the country of origin. I think that's clear. And for, for so, archives, it's different uh, because you see now, sorry to finish this, I see that, for instance, between, uh, between Belgium and Rwanda, they're discussing archives about political military issues and socioeconomic issues, basically about minerals. And they're still in Brussels. Now, they have agreed on digital repatriation, but Rwanda is a very pragmatic country. They just want to have the information so they can work but it's their decision to accept it. And then for me, it's acceptable. But if, if we decide, if the global North decide, you know, or we'll, we'll repatriate it digitally, no, it's over, it's 21st century. Uh, yeah, Payalmar, any thought on that? Particularly with the, with the object yes, that yeah. in Indonesia. Yeah. yeah, well, I tend to agree with yours, um, yeah. Um, digitization is one thing. It it would um, open up access, um, um, also enhance our knowledge about the uh, different items in the collection, right? Um, very important, of course. And I see here that um, the question is about shared manage and shared control. Uh, by the way, Alex, how are you? Um, so um, it's very important. Yeah, to have that kind of um, equal access and also production of knowledge and all that. But it cannot substitute, I think, the symbolic value of returning actual objects, even if it's one, right? So um, that dimension is very important if you want to talk about like a larger context about, yeah, so again, I, I mean, I'm going back to what I said earlier. It's not about returning objects, but it's about the symbolic value of that act itself, that matters, no? So um, of course, in, the, in that process, I think digitization can be very, very helpful. Um, I really actually want to see a crowdsourced um, provenance research, no? To open up really, like people have knowledge. I mean, they're everywhere in the world um, without we even knowing them, no? So if we can open up such a process, that would be wonderful. But um, uh, again, it would not be able to substitute or replace uh, the symbol symbolic value of the actual returning of an object. That would be my response. That was very succinctly encapsulate the, the kind of, yeah, the, the kind of embodied experience that, uh, that uh, were to be experienced from uh, returning the objects to one country actually. Uh, Soka, one last thought. Yes. Um, uh, it, it could be helpful, but uh, I agree with uh, Hilma on, on that regard. I mean, like for, for Cambodia, like every time we, we get the object return, we, we always have this ceremony. We are talking about the return of the spirit and, and reconcile you know, with the past, the violent past and stuff like that. So it's important for the object to return. And it is it, the like sometimes what about we uh, replica? And I mean, that probably another issue we're talking about digital repatriation. And I don't know, it's just, I just feel like it's better to return objects. Okay, to return object and also to return it uh, in original form. Not in replica. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you very much.
it's yeah. like uh, sorry, like I I talked earlier about uh, the the Cambodian culture, the Cambodian perception about uh, all those sides. I mean, where the, the temple, where the spirit stay, and all of that. So, so yeah. So in Cambodian perspective, of course, it's connected to the sociocultural mm -hmm. metrics or context mm -hmm. in Cambodia right now uh, with Nekna, with Nekta, with the with the data. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just just for the context, like. Even now, like uh, when we before we do excavation, we have to to ask permission to do that. Before we do restoration at the temple, we have to ask permission to do that. Even we do like uh, rest uh, conservation, like conservation work in a museum, like you have to uh, destroy some part of the object or stuff like that. You have to ask permission. So every step that you appropriate the object. You have to to ask permission. So from our perspective, it's kind of like a spirit, a living thing. Okay. And we, we also have an issue with like how we we but the, I think uh, sometimes it, it, like we were talking about living thing, but how we going to present it in a museum nowadays? We just copy what the Western do, just display it as a artifact display it as a dead object but that's not what we're supposed to do but you know it, it's more very really complicated to because it's also got to do with the money and you know how are you like uh, we have a lot of objects how are we going to uh, like uh, present them as like you know in a natural form yeah that's that's also one difficulty of it uh, on that hard note, I guess we should finish the uh, seminar today. Thank you very much for uh, Yos. Thank you very much for Payumar uh, for Thank you. Thank uh, you. being here and then uh, discussing this thing with us. Thank you, Soka, for joining from Phnom Penh. Uh, Anya. Yep. I yours. think we should say to the audience that today's webinar was a men's affair, but tomorrow it's a women's affair. Oh yes, <laughs> we, 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 yeah, we do that so. actually, <laughs> we do that actually, yeah, yeah, we, we talk about gender, about the, the gender of this, uh, this, this back-to-back -back seminar, and then, yeah, uh, this is men of hair, and then tomorrow is a woman's affair, so I'm a bit sorry about that, but uh, uh, tomorrow is also uh, uh, promised to be a very interesting discussion as well uh, about the identity uh, the culture and also the restitution. Uh, mainly, we'll, we'll talk about uh, context in Thailand and also in uh, Myanmar. Okay, again, thank you for Yos, for Paimars, for Soka for being here. Thank you for Anna, who is managing this uh, webinar on the background uh, for uh, the, the smooth running of these uh, seminars. and. Thank you for all the attendees. Uh, we have a very high number of uh, participants, actually. Uh, the highest we have in this seminar series. So thank you very much for that. And uh, see you tomorrow, I guess. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay, fel stay healthy. Thank you. Yeah. It was good to chat with you. <laughs> right. Bye, then. Bye. Okay, bye. bye, -bye.